opportunity last time this, this semester to be able to preach. And I get the distinct privilege of being the last one. So that's a, that's a singular honor. Uh, in your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. And that's where we're going to be this evening. Jeremiah chapter 17. And we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> And then would you stand as we read God's word? <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says Yahweh, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind, and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from Yahweh. And he will be like a juniper in the desert. And will not see when prosperity comes, but will dwell in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh, and whose trust is Yahweh. And he will be like a tree planted by the water that sends forth its roots by a stream, and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor refrain from yielding fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to look into your word. Again, this evening, Father, we are reminded of our need of you, and uh, this particular section of text is no exception. And I just pray that you would help um, encourage, convict, edify, and that you would do all of this for your glory's sake, in Christ's name, amen. You feel like a spiritual tumbleweed. You feel like a spiritual tumbleweed. I remember a couple weeks ago, I was driving into class and I was going down the highway and I remember seeing off in the distance something pretty, pretty large along the side of the road. And I was, a good deal off and as I got closer I realized it was a gigantic tumbleweed and seeing that tumbleweed reminded me of our trip over here a couple of years ago as we prepared to find a home right before seminary so at, at that time it had been probably 20 years since I'd gone east of the mountains and so I had forgotten largely what the landscape looked like and I remember on our drive, looking out the window on the several hours on the road and seeing in the summertime, just this vast expanse of, of farmland, of, of empty plains that were just dotted with farms and ranches. And I remember as we were driving, there, in most places, there wasn't a whole lot of vegetation. There was mostly just the sun-bleached, dead, dry grass and rocks. But, but I do remember that on occasion, looking out the window, seeing these little groves of, of trees and bushes. And I remember thinking to myself, those trees, those bushes, they, they've got to be near some water. It is so hot out. Because everything else, all the vegetation out here is all dead and dry. And so th these things, they have to be near some water. But, but like the, the barren, dry landscape just over the mountains, believers, Christians can go through, through seasons in life where they are either withered or withering or they are thriving. And that all depends on their proximity to the living water. So my question for you this evening is, do you feel like your relationship with Christ is like that tumbleweed along the side of the road? Is it withered? Is it dry? Is it dead? Do you feel parched in your particular walk with Christ? Do you find yourself looking for security looking for reliance, finding trust in the things of the world and not in God. 
if that, if that sounds like you, this section here in Jeremiah is going to help you understand that you will flourish if you find your reliance in Yahweh and not man. You will flourish if you find your reliance in Yahweh and not man. And so in this section, we're going to see two types of people set up. Two types of people and where they have chosen to invest their trust, where they have chosen to invest their reliance. And the first is the cursed man's reliance in verses 5 through 6. And the second is the blessed man's reliance in verses 7 and 8. So let's look first at the cursed man's reliance in verses 5 through 6. Verse 5 says, Thus says Yahweh, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from Yahweh. So we get at the very beginning of verse 5. We see, thus says Yahweh. And what does he say? He says, cursed. And what we get here is this word from Yahweh. He's delivering this divine curse that is a threat to function both as a deterrent and judicially. As a deterrent to keep people from falling into a particular type of behavior, but also judicially as it condemns people who have already fallen into a type of behavior. And what is that type of behavior? It says, those who trust in mankind. The word trusts there means to feel secure. It's used elsewhere in a place like Proverbs 25, verse 19, where we get this picture of the, the folly of, of placing trust, placing reliance in a treacherous man in a period of distress. And so we get this, this idea here that Yahweh is proclaiming a curse on those who would find their security specifically in man. And so these types of people generally who place their trust, their reliance, their security in man and the things of man, whether it's it's uh, militarily, whether it's economically, whether it's uh, intellectually, or whether it's technologically, they typically will drift into this, this period of, of complacency, of, of finding satisfaction in those things. And then they will invariably begin to drift away from God. And so the question is, does that sound like you? Have you begin to put more trust in those types of things, in the military, in the economy, rather than in God. But notice what he says next. He says, and makes flesh his strength. So he expands the idea here, and he says the cursed man makes or sets up flesh or humanity as his strength. This person has devoted their mental energy, their mental focus, to finding their help in mankind, in humanity. And so part of the indictment against Judah at this period is its disposition toward leaning toward placing its hope, its help in man, in man for deliverance. But here we see that that simply shows that their heart has turned away from Yahweh. That's what he says at the end of verse 5. He says, whose heart turns away from Yahweh. To turn away here means to fall down. But theologically, it implies to, to turn aside from God. And so we get a similar idea in Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 9, where, where God speaks about the hearts of the people who have turned aside, who have turned away from him. And so we get a summary statement in there of, of the apostasy of their heart. And so the idea is that, that these people, they have, who have placed their faith and their trust and their, their expectations, their reliance on man, they would rather place their trust in those things than on Yahweh's divine resources. But we get this picture in verse 5 of, of what the, the heart, what the disposition of the, the cursed man looks like. But what does the curse look like in itself? Look at verse 6. It says, And he will be like a juniper in the desert, and will not see when prosperity comes, but will dwell in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt which is not inhabited. That phrase at the very beginning of verse 6, and he will be, it sets up the consequence of the man who finds his security 
finds his reliance in man and not Yahweh. He says he will become like a juniper in the desert. If you've got a different translation, it might be translated as a tree or a shrub. The idea here isn't so much to focus in on what type of tree or what type of shrub. The, the focus here is where this tree is located. It's in the desert. It's a desert shrub. But look how he continues in the next line. And we'll not see when prosperity comes. This desert shrub living in the desert won't see when prosperity comes. But what is prosperity? What is it referring to here? It means what is pleasant, what is desirable. And so we get this, this idea conveyed here that what is desirable in the desert is rain, is rain. Because rain produces fertility both in the soil and in the plants who, who live there, who reside there. It reminds me of our lawn last, last summer. Our lawn, I foolishly waited too long to try to figure out how to turn the sprinklers on, and then I couldn't figure out how to turn the sprinklers on. So it had drifted into uh, early to mid-summer before I finally got our sprinklers on, and our front yard just completely baked, torched. It was, our grass was dead. And what our grass needed at that point was what was desirable for it was the rain produced by the sprinklers. And like that, what was desirable for the plant that lives in the desert here is the rain that God produces. That's what's desirable. Only here, that desert plant will never see that rain. It will never see that rain. It won't see it when it comes. Instead, look at the next line. It will dwell in the stony wastes in the wilderness. This man who's placed his security, his trust in mankind will settle, will reside in a stony desert, a climate where there's little to no water and, and scarcely able to produce and sustain life. And so this, this desert shrub is becoming parched, it's becoming dehydrated. But as if this wasn't enough, look at the next line. It's a land of salt, which is not inhabited. I watched a video just a few days ago of a guy who went down to Mexico who went to, to tour a, a salt farm and I remember this salt this salt farm was beautiful and it was beautiful partly because the the pathway that he was able to walk along was completely bleached white like the the salt in the water had seeped into the ground and just completely turned it white and then it stood in such stark contrast to the pools where they were farming the salt which were this fluorescent green and this fluorescent pink. But what was most noticeable about these salt lakes was that around the edges, there was no vegetation mm -hmm. at all. It was dead, it was barren, it was devoid of life. And so like those salt lakes, this desert shrub is gonna dwell in a land of salt it's no ordinary land. It's a salty, unproductive, uninhabited land. Because what happens is that when salt seeps into the soil and the salinity level reaches a certain level, the land becomes unproductive, unable to produce any agriculture. And in an agrarian society, if your land is not producing, it's abandoned. It's abandoned. And so here, the comparison is that the person who trusts in the resources, in the strength, in the, in the help that man can bring, they're going to end up like that desert shrub, living in this barren, this scorched, this salt-ridden land, dehydrated, unfruitful, and, and struggling just to survive. And so we get to the end of this, this section. What, what's our implication? It's avoid the danger of being self-reliant. Avoid the danger of being self-reliant. When we go through those, those moments, those seasons in life where we're, we're given to being Mr. or even Mrs. Fix-It, how are we demonstrating our trust and our reliance in Christ? Us here, most of us here, we are self-motivated, self-willed, self-determined men. And, and part of that is because we have to be. We, we are 
in class all day long. We have schedules that we have to keep. But the danger in that is when you, when you start to depend more on your ability as an expositor, your ability as a counselor, instead of going in humble dependence, humble reliance to Christ, depending on his spirit. And so you might be sitting there asking yourself, well, how do I know if this has become the case for me? And part of that is you can examine your prayer life. You can examine your prayer habits because prayerlessness is a good indicator that your your life has slowly started to drift away from uh, dependence on Christ. It, it has diminished in that particular season. And so to, to remedy that, you, you, you can make it a priority. You can scatter it throughout your day, whether it's while you're reading, whether it's while you're doing chores for your wife, whether it's before you sit down to do your, your devotionals in the morning, whether it's with your wife before you go to bed, whether it's with your kids before they go to bed, just scatter it throughout your day. Show that it's a priority because in prayer, we, we demonstrate our reliance on, on the resources that only he can give. But that leads us to our, our second type of person and their choice and their option of putting their their trust and it is the blessed man's reliance the blessed man's reliance in verses seven and eight look at verse seven though it says blessed is the man who trusts in yahweh and whose trust is yahweh that term blessed right at the beginning of verse seven here we get this complete opposite response to what we saw earlier in verse 5. In verse 5, we saw cursed is the man. Here, it's blessed is the man. And blessed here means to be filled with strength, to be filled up. And it's typically given, this this is typically given as a commendation for, uh, for good behavior or, or a praiseworthy uh, deed. And so, we're asking ourselves, what's the praiseworthy deed? What's the praiseworthy behavior? It's right here. It says, the man who trusts in Yahweh. And so we get this same terminology that we saw earlier in verse 5, only here, the contrasted idea is the object of the trust, the object of the reliance. That's what changes. The cursed man, the cursed man's reliance is on man. The blessed man's reliance is on Yahweh. But the verse doesn't end there. It goes on to say, and whose trust is Yahweh. The idea is expanded, and it's expanded in a clause that shows equivalence. In other words, Yahweh is his trust. And so those whose trust is Yahweh, they are blessed. They are blessed by finding deliverance. They are blessed with answered prayer. They are blessed with a straight path. They are blessed with with joy and gladness. They are blessed with with peace and an absence of fear. But just like in verse 6, where we were given how the cursed man is going to end up, here we're given in verse 8 how the man who trusts in Yahweh will be blessed. Look at verse 8. It says, And he will be like a tree planted by the water that sends forth its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor refrain from yielding fruit. And so that phrase right at the beginning of verse eight, and he will be, we get another consequence, only this time it's the consequence of the man who's placed his trust in Yahweh. He will become like a tree planted by the water. This term tree here is used in its generic sense. And so again, we see less emphasis on what type of tree, and again, more on where it's located. Here, it's located by the water. The blessed man, like a tree, is not in the desert, like the cursed man. The blessed man is beside the water. He's beside the water. It's like those groves of trees on the drive over. They were beside the water. 
But notice the next line. It says that sends forth its roots by a stream. That term for stream there, uh, a canal. It gives us this picture of an en unending source of water, an unending source of nourishment. It's an unending source of nourishment that allows the roots of the tree to have free reign because it's near its water source. It's near its source of life. And so the, the, the blessed man is blessed because his trust is in Yahweh and his, his roots are allowed to spread out because he's near his, his life source. And so we are blessed. We are blessed by our proximity to Christ who is our never-failing source of life. But there's more. Look at the next line. And will not fear when the heat comes. And here we're given a particular scenario. When the heat comes. Heat here, the, the, the summer heat. And we know that, that heat is dangerous for trees. But one scientist wrote this. Listen. The warmer atmosphere sucks more moisture from plants and soil. When it's especially hot, the trees even leak some of the water they are so desperate to retain. And so in this dangerous, this, this life-threatening situation, the, the, the blessed man never even begins to be afraid. The, the trials in life, the heat, when it gets turned up, it leaves the blessed man unaffected because his trust is in Yahweh, who is both abundant and is unchanging, and not man, who is fickle and finite. But there's still more. The next statement, it says, but its leaves will be green. Green means luxurious or, or leafy. The idea here is that the tree will be thriving. The same scientist in the same article wrote this. To cut losses during drought, trees close pores in their leaves, or they shed their leaves entirely. And so we get this picture here. The blessed man not only survives the heat, he doesn't shed his leaves, he doesn't drop his leaves, he thrives. He has luxuriant, leafy, green leaves. But he continues in the next line. And it will not be anxious in a year of drought. Again, we're given another scenario. This time it's drought. And drought is potentially dangerous to trees. It causes the trees to, to suck the, the, the water out of the soil where there is none greater greater demand and less of a supply but the one whose trust is in Yahweh he never becomes anxious because he his trust is in Yahweh and he he has his life source right there he has his life source nearby but but I want you to see something here notice the difference between verse 6 and verse 8 verse 6 the the the, um, the desert shrub, the de desert tree, doesn't see when prosperity comes. The rain comes for the desert shrub. The cursed man has rain and yet is not able to make any use of it. He doesn't see it. But the blessed man, the blessed man has no rain. He has no rain and yet he's not anxious. He's not anxious because he draws from divine resources. But I think even more importantly, look at the last line. Nor refrain from yielding fruit. You will never cease to produce fruit. And so we get the picture of, of luxuriant leaves and, and, and a production of fruit, which gives us this idea that this tree's roots have spread far. And so we're given this image of a person who, who can endure danger, who can endure difficulty in life, and can even produce fruit during it. Because that person's trust is in Yahweh and not man. 
So we get to the end of this verse and what's our implication? It's remember your life source. Remember your life source. Our life source as believers is Christ and we are reminded continually in scripture to abide in him. That's John 15 and then 1 John. And, and by his grace, we are also given his word, which is his canal, his water source from which we can drink. And so, brother, are you weary? Are you weary? Drink from the word. Are you parched? Drink from the word. Are you withering? Drink from the word. Find a verse verses this week. Commit them to memory. Commit them to memory to help you remember to drink from your life source. I'm working on Psalm 73 verse 20, verse, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I, 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 need, I desire nothing on earth. And so let, let his word remind you of your life source and to drink from it. To drink from it every day. You know, what made that tumbleweed alongside the road was so interesting was not just its size, but what made it so interesting was what it represented. It re represented something that was once alive, that had the resources that it needed, that was surviving, but now it's been cut off. It's withered. It's dried up. It's dead. But you don't need to be like that tumbleweed. You, you can flourish if you find your reliance on Yahweh and not man. And so in this, this series of verses, we've seen two types of people and where they've chosen to place their trust. We've seen the cursed man's reliance in man, and we've seen the blessed man's reliance in Yahweh. And so we see that God blesses the one who's actively trusting in him, who's actively relying on him. And that person doesn't have to be withered. They can flourish even in seasons that are difficult, even in seasons that are, that are dangerous, because their trust is in Yahweh. And so if you're here this evening and you, and you haven't given your, your life to, to Christ yet, I would encourage you. I would encourage you to repent of your sins. Turn away from them. Turn away from them and, and embrace Christ as your Savior. Embrace him as your Savior and give your life to him. Plant yourself next to that water source. But I need to ask, what has replaced your trust in Christ? What has replaced your trust in Christ? Has your time in, your, in the Word been replaced by time watching uh, CNN? Have you allowed your trust to drift into looking to what the government's doing? Have, has your time in prayer been replaced by time watching the stock market? Placing your trust in how, how vibrant your bank account is? Reinstall those good habits in your life. Reinstall those good habits, whether it's prayer, whether it's time in the word, whether it's listening to music that's edifying, whether it's listening to podcasts that build you up, and then reduce your consumption of the things that are, are, are causing you to trust more in man and, and to, to wither. I read a quote from a guy named A.C. Dixon. He said, when we depend on organizations, we get what organizations can do. When we depend on education, we get what education can do. When we depend on man, we get what man can do. But when we depend on prayer, we get what God can do. Let's, let's show our dependence on God and what, what he can do and not man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Just pray that you would use it to encourage these men, equip them for today, for this week, and uh, just continue to, to build them up, help them to remember that you are their life source and to, to come to you in these seasons where they are withered. Help me to remember this. We just pray that you do all this for your glory's sake. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Good job.
Thank you. Thank you.